So good morning, everyone. Faces, it's lovely to see you. Uh, again, I'm, my name is Wendy Bernheim. Welcome to Doctor Training and Development. Uh, we want to make sure that your day here is as sunshiny as possible in spite of the weather. Um, so we are here to help you have as we can. Um, we are just across the way over here, so if you need anything, please don't be shy. Uh, there should be someone at the front desk all morning, but if not, we have a little bell. It's okay to ring the bell. Uh, we're very responsive. We try only to drool a little bit when you ring the bell. It's okay. <laughs> um, so please, please come by, see us, say hello. Um, we are happy to help. A few little housekeeping things. Uh, I know that you all have cell phones and laptops and whatever. I know that everybody would be appreciative if you just kind of, you know, turn those on silent, vibrant, whatever you need to do while the, the meeting's going on. If you do need to make or take a phone call, since it's raining outside, outside is probably not a great uh, idea. But we do have a meeting room that's open, I think, most of the day. So if you go down the hall and take a right, uh, there'll be a uh, room that's there. You're welcome to do that. So a good place to take a private phone call. It's a good reception there, so you should be good. Also down the hall, you will, as you maybe as you came in, you notice that there is a uh, break room. We have a refrigerator there. The refrigerator nearest the door as you come in is the OTD refrigerator. It actually says OTD on it. I would suggest using that one. It's less of a science experiment than the one next door to it. Um, so there's always room in there, though, if you have something that you'd like to keep in there. Uh, you're also welcome to use that as a snack area or whatever you want to do. We also have refreshments here. It looks like somebody's already been into the coffee. That's good. Uh, if you need more coffee, let us know. We'd be happy to, to uh, come back and do that. So if you're not properly caffeinated, we'll make sure that you stay that way. Um, there's also hot water for tea. If you need plates, cups, glasses, whatever you need, those are there as well. Um, so please help yourself. I believe we have a little piggy that's there. Yeah, our little happy face guy. Uh, if you feel so inclined, and I, I hope you do, uh, there, if you want to put a couple of coins in the happy face, um, that makes sure that the next group has some coffee as well. So if you don't like piggy communication, that would be great. Did everybody find parking this morning? Anybody have trouble with parking? Hopefully you found a parking space along our building, the side of this building here or in the back. We ask that you don't park across adjacent to the buildings across the parking lot here. Um, they're not always as happy as we are to have you here and they tend to tow. So if you found yourself parked across the way over there, when there's a break, you might want to just dash across it perhaps move it. You should be able to find CDFW spaces and they're marked CDFW, so near this building or in the back. If you can't find a place to park, you can always park across the street and that's perfect. Mm -hmm. So just be careful as you can apply. Um, we all need to know where restrooms are. So as you go down the hall, take a right. Gentlemen, you are all the way down to the end of the hallway. Ladies, you're just the hallway. And as you walk down that way again, you're going to pass the meeting room. There's also the PC lab. I think that's open today. So if you need to, uh, if you have a, don't have a, a lab copy, you need to, to check something on the computer, you can dash in there. And that's open as well. If we should need to evacuate the building, even though it's a bad hair day, we might have to do that. So if we should have to do that, obviously this is an exit. You can exit by the door. Most of you came in this morning. Um, I would ask that somebody grab the sign-in sheet Take it with us, and we'll all meet in the parking lot just adjacent to the building over here. So uh, that would be the best way to evacuate the building. So I'm not sure if you miss anything. I don't think I've missed anything. Has Have I missed anything? Is there anything that you need, any questions, concerns, or anything you need from us? Okay, well, again, we're very happy to have you here. Please, please, please come across and say hello. Um, don't hesitate to ask if you need anything, and enjoy your day. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Oh, one more thing before I let you go. I don't know if you've noticed, but we have some what we call kudos cards out. These are for you to take, and, but you must, if you take them, you must use them. So this is a great way. How many times do we have colleagues, staff, supervisors, whoever, that we just want to say, you did a great job today. Thank you for whatever it is. A handwritten note can go a long way. So we encourage you to take a stack of kudos cards with a pledge that you will use them. I used one this morning, so I, I will practice what I preach. Um, but it's a great way to do it, and they're yours to take if you'd like. And if you run out, we'll be happy to make one. So please use them. Enjoy your day. Thanks, Wendy. Thanks, Wendy. Um, okay.
So um, I just want to kick things off and show you how to work with Oscar. And we are at uh, non floating oil information meeting for the Technical Advisory Committee uh, to Oscar. So, um, and a number of people this morning actually have asked, why are we here today? So, background material. Um, so just very quickly, I mean, everyone in the room realizes we have heavy oil production and transporting challenges. Um, reach which that happens is always, uh, as, as very well so transparent to us, it's something we like, but we know that it occurs. Um, we also know from experience here and elsewhere that heavy oil, or any oil, when it's used to become submerged, is problematic, especially with respect to detection. And also in California and elsewhere, there's a lot of public concern about that oil um, being transported and potentially being destroyed. Um, and last year, we saw Senate Bill 709 be introduced into the California legislature, which would have introduced the um, mandate on offer and regulated to um, improve our potentially help improve our readiness for the world. That bill is in suspense now, so it didn't reach join the last year, but it did trigger on the past a discussion about heavy oil last summer. And in that discussion, we asked the question of, well, what are the real risks of California and oil transport and bills? And uh, what steps can be taken to mitigate? So they asked this phosphor. Phosphor uh, scratched our collective heads and um, felt like uh, a workshop bringing in some, some folks outside of Oscar to help inform the questions was uh, a good approach. So that's why we're all here. Uh, well, yeah, let me make, make a few words. I'm, I'm Steve Ricks, the chair of the, the PAC. And as Julie mentioned, this is a meeting, a PAC meeting. Uh, the PAC is made up of uh, representatives from the various stakeholder groups that uh, have interest in uh, what OSPR does and how it's being done. And uh, we, we meet uh, roughly quarterly. This is a this is a kind of a special meeting that uh, the agenda is strictly for this workshop. And uh, typically, the TAC develops a list of issues of interest that uh, we ask OSPR to uh, brief us on various issues. And this uh, topic of non-floating oils is high on our list this, uh, this year. And uh, Osprey has graciously agreed to put, the, put this workshop on. I think the agenda is really top-notch. You know, we should get a lot out of it. And uh, <coughs> we thank you guys for, uh, for putting this on. We thank, we thank all the speakers that came uh, along this today and impart their knowledge and will help uh, address some of the questions we have. Um, Judge, please again. I'm just going to shift gears and talk a little bit about the format, uh, especially for the folks on the side. So, um, so as you said, we're going to hear some great talks from speakers today. and. Um, because we have a number of people on Skype and a lot more people than are normally at a tech meeting, um, we're going to please ask a whole question until after all the speakers are done, and then we're going to have a panel discussion at break. Where Dow is going to moderate for us, and uh, hopefully we'll get everyone's questions addressed during that uh, panel discussion. Um, and a note to Skype users, you can type your questions in any time, and we'll be monitoring those questions and we'll be good time. At the bottom of the slide, there's uh, and most of those Skype folks are people's laptops at this point. There's a website here where you can uh, look at uh, uh, one page summaries that all the speakers provided. So you can follow along with those today. You can use them afterwards to kind of help you piece these together afterwards and then slow down the time um, We have a couple of substitutions today. Um, Mark Gregory, who was going to do the talk on GPS card regulation. And so we're going to. Where's the plan, Ellen? I think, as it turns out, um, Jim had a lot of that information that's going to be covered in his presentation. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Jim's going to kind of cover that, but I think that we'll 
be able to go then a little more time for lunch. Probably won't take the 20 minutes, so we'll um, adjust the schedule a little bit. And then also for the toxicology talk, it'll be me and it'll be uh, Oscar Toxicologist here for this evening. Better job than I was going <laughs> So, um, yeah. So I think we're going to do some introductions. You want to go around the room? Oh, um, yeah, let's just go around the room real quick and go around okay. and people. Hi, I'm Jeff Muscat. I'm a senior environmental scientist with Oscar, and I'm your audio visual specialist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Gordon Shrimp with the California Energy Commission, a senior fuel specialist, and I have one of the presentations this morning. Good morning, Tom Cohn, the OSPER Administrator. Good morning, Mike Schomer. I'm a field scientist with OSPER at Fairfields, and I'm sitting by the door because it's raining. I'm all call, it's going to be a Charlie Sheen day. And I'm uh, Chris Barker from NOAA's Emergency Response Division, and I'll be talking a little later. I'll tell you a little more about myself then. Yes, I'm Jordan Stout. I'm the NOAA Scientific Support Coordinator with NOAA's Emergency Response Division, and my role is typically to be essentially a uh, science advisor or part of a science advice team to the Coast Guard for oil spills and chemical spills. I'm Greg McGowan. I'm the program manager at OSPER for the Response Support and Technology Group. I'm Jonathan Fisch of California Coastal Commission. I'm Jackie Michelle. I'm with a company called Research Planning Inc. in Columbia, South Carolina. So I've traveled probably farther than anyone else. But I'm part of the uh, NOAA Science Support team. I've been part of that team since 1978. And I am talking. I'm giving three talks today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I'm Steve Hampton, uh, Assistant Deputy Administrator with OSPER. I'm Kurt Hansen with the U.S. Coast Guard's Research and Development Center out of New London, Connecticut. I think I'm a tiny bit further away than you. <laughs> 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 Glad to be here. Yeah, we'll work out. We'll work it out. Good morning, everybody. I'm Jim Elliott. I'm with uh, TNT Salvage and also the American Salvage Association. And I came from yeah. Sorry. Via China. Via China. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm Ben Eichenberg. I'm with uh, an attorney with San Francisco Baykeeper, and uh, I work on uh, benefit settlements. I'm Melissa Bonds with OSPER. I'm a senior environmental scientist supervisor, and I supervise the Central California Environmental Scientists. I'm, I'm Chris Dixon. I'm the senior environmental scientist supervisor for Southern California. And I'm Kathleen Jennings. I'm the Senior Environmental Scientist Supervisor for um, Northern California. I'm Linda Spurtis. I'm from the San Francisco Bay Commission. And I'm the Spill Program Coordinator for our agency. Uh, April Da Silva, Toxicologist for Osper's Natural Resource Damage Assessment Unit. I'm Matt Resboni, the other TAC member. <laughs> I'm Rachel Fabian. Uh, I'm an Environmental Scientist uh, with the Metro Tag Group. Um, my background is from oceanography, so I'm really excited to be here and here on the topic. I'm Ryan Todd. I'm an attorney at OSPR. Eric Nolstein, OSPR Legal. Jeff Oteed, OSPR. Good morning. My name is Randy Eman. I'm the branch chief of environmental response branch for OSPR. Okay. <laughs> do, um, do the people on the tech, especially the tech members on Skype, do they want to introduce themselves? Well, I'm Kevin. Yeah. Oh, that's Nancy Turner. Oh, Nancy Turner. Okay. Yeah, they can announce themselves. Yeah, I'm Turner. Hi, everybody. I'm Nancy Turner. Okay. Well, I say, we can just say, yeah, safe, yeah, safe with Chalk Seed. Um, the list is on the, on the oh. screen there. You can oh, all see who's in the screen. Oh, it's tiny. Safe with Chalk Seed is also a uh, staff member and Dan Peter from the Coastal Technology Center is also here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Could people want to start um, I think so. I, I called Adam. He said they could hear. Uh, yes. Um, a couple of us 
just didn't introduce ourselves um, in that round robin. Annie Nelson. Oh. Hi. Wanna... I'm Annie Nelson. <laughs> <laughs> Senior environmental scientist at Osper. That's achievable technology. And uh, Ellen Thoreau Daniels, I'm kind of her <clears throat> companion working on um, applied response technologies. Rather than, uh, okay. Um, I'm going to take a minute uh, or two to just go over the read ahead materials that um, some folks had in advance. Uh, maybe not everybody had in advance. Uh, this website, and for those on Skype, I'm pointing at the web address that's at the bottom of the screen there. Um, you can also get to it apparently more easily uh, by just Googling OSPR space TAC, so OSPR space TAC. And then once you get there, you'll find a couple of documents loaded up. Um, and the TAC members um, were guided to these documents in advance if they do some read ahead. And there are two, primarily, there, there are many documents covering um, a lot of the background over the last 15 or 20 years uh, of work that's been done on onboarding oils. Um, and here are a couple of them, and I'm waving around uh, the two that are on the website. Uh, one has to do with impacts of inland spill response uh, from onboarding oils, and the other one's an operational guide. Uh, that's probably the best one-stop shop for a lot of the background information on feasibility of various options for uh, non polluting oil detection and containment and recovery and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we were not suggesting that people read all of both of these documents, uh, but there are some particular places, and for those on Skype who are just now maybe looking at that webpage and seeing these documents, um, I had suggested that maybe people look at pages 6 to 20, page 6 through page 20, and the operational guide. Um, again, I think all of it has value, but those were the things that you needed to skin in advance with probably the best one. Here's the operation guide. Uh, oh, here's, uh, Jackie's holding up a, you know, like a six by eight format spiral bound ops guide. I really like the looks of the thing. I mean, it may be something that California would consider as modifying and using as, as one of their own uh, ops guides. The other one, um, the inland spill options for minimizing environmental impacts of inland spill response is the other document on the website. And I'd suggest that maybe people look at pages 13 and 14, 17 through 26, and 54 through 66. Now, the TAC members or anybody else in this room who didn't do the read ahead, I've got copies. <laughs> uh, can skim them during break, and, and then we'll know who did the read. And let's do their homework now instead of having done it before. The other things that Julie already mentioned that I've mentioned that are on the website as well are the one page summaries that each of the speakers were asked to uh, put together. And if any of the people in the room uh, copied those down for their own use, it could serve as notes um, today, so you're not doing so much of your own scribbling. Um, and then for the people joining by Skype, that might give you a good opportunity <laughs> to gather some of your own notes and thoughts as well. They may become part of a follow-on workshop report. Um, and it may have some other utilities as well. But that's what we kind of ask for folks to do is sort of their non cloning oil 101, you know, to get some of their own homework done before coming into this meeting because we're hoping to not do a lot of background information. I don't want to go right to non cloning oil 201 for the presentations today. Um, so that's what I have. There are other um, related documents that we can make available on the Oscar website after this if you guys have any desire to read more. Um, so we can make those available to you guys as well. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. And then I think probably we didn't talk about this, or maybe we talked about it, we didn't really answer it for ourselves. Um, Jordan is going to get up now and kind of talk about how this is organized. And I'm assuming that people will just kind of find their own way up and we don't have to introduce each next speaker or one speaker can introduce the next speaker or something like that. But I'll start off by saying, here's Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Jordan. Um, so uh, uh, when we talk about the role that we provide in the Coast Guard, the NOAA provides the Coast Guard scientific support team. That's really in the response. But in the, in the, the way that we try to explain it to other folks who don't necessarily think about that or aren't aware of how to apply science to a spill response, we, we try to frame it in the, in the form of five questions. It's actually our science of skills class is also sort of structured in the way it needs to 
five questions. What got spilled? Where are they going to go? What's going to, what might get hit? How's it going to hurt? What do you do about it? And so we thought that rather than try to do just a book report of all of the reports that are out there about not flowing oils, maybe it would help to um, spark more conversation for this group to try to see if, if to ask these sort of five questions and structure the workshop and the information meeting sort of five questions and see if we can realistically answer those five questions. And if not, then are the data gaps and how do we, how do we mitigate those data gaps? So things like what got spilled. So I think one of the big questions is, you know, do we have, what's the extent of non-floating oil transport in California? Where is it going? Where, the, you know, what are the, what are the transport mechanisms? What are the paths? What are the volume? So forth. How big of a problem is this compared to other other oil? Uh, where will it go? That's going <clears> to <throat> require an understanding of what you'd expect the oil to do in the environment. Um, so some information on behavior in the environment. How do you detect it um, to go try to chase it down? Do we have modeling capabilities like we do with the surface oil to try to estimate where oil might be in the coming days, hours, or days? So you can kind of prioritize and you know, stage your equipment. Um, what might get hit? So what are the sensitive resources that might be in the path of the oil, um, especially in the water column with that thing, resources? And typically we think of it those in terms of environmental resources, but it could be things like water intake like that too, which might be particularly important for in the waterways. Um, how are those species, how will those sensitive resources get impacted? That's more of a toxicology question, uh, or, or you know, what are the physical and toxicological impacts of these oils to sensitive resources? And then what can you do about it? What are the, what are the potential response options and what are the environmental trade-off issues associated with those response options? So we tried to schedule the, uh, much of the presentation around those five questions, and we lumped the, uh, two of the questions together, what might get hit and how will it hurt? Uh, <coughs> So most of those questions will be addressed before lunch, and then uh, we'll get into more in-depth discussion about what can you do about these non-floating wells and what uh, what Coast Guard regulations are in place to address these sort of questions. So we'll so forth in the panel discussion afterwards. Questions about questions. <laughs> okay. So. Uh, I think we're important. Well, good morning again. Um, as you know, I'm going to jump the names commission a little bit more. I've been at the commission. Uh, 26 years now, and in the same area of uh, analysis, transportation and energy, uh, which it was traditional petroleum fuels, and now it's renewable fuels, even uh, electricity cars and things like that. So, but we also look a lot at crude oil, refinery operations. We collect an awful lot of information on refinery ops, uh, transportation of petroleum products in the state, within the state. Uh, we monitor prices, we look at um, price spikes, we work with the California Attorney General's office, we're investigating uh, price spikes, um, and all the data we collect that's company specific uh, is collected under our Petroleum Information, Industry Information Reporting Act, or, or PIRA, and we have a very strong confidentiality provision. So, Basically, when people do our Freedom of Information Act, get company specific data, our executive, ex executive director will say not. So, no one's been able to overcome that. So, this is a very valuable tool that allows us not only to collect routine confidential business sensitive information, but also to go out on an ad hoc basis. Meaning, we can do a special survey. Um, and we can even call people up on the phone and say, hey, I saw your refinery has a you know, fire. What's the, you know, where are some of the immediate knowledge of consequence at this point in time? And they'll tell us because that information doesn't get back out and compromise the, how they're trying to deal with a shortage of a product by mothers in the marketplace without the market escalating on them. And so an ad hoc survey uh, example would be just two weeks ago, we went out, um, we may have you're aware of Aliso Canyon is a natural gas pump storage facility in Southern California. Had a, a big leak. Uh, 
they uh, they shut it down for a period of time, and now they did a well integrity analysis to allow some degree of reinjection to some uh, smaller subset of capacity. Well, it's not at normal capacity. This is something that's used in California and the United States to overcome the spike in natural gas demand in the winter. You draw from money gas storage. That's how you deal with it. There's an inadequate pipeline capacity. However, there are three pipelines coming into California for natural gas that are currently down. And so there's a concern about adequate supply of natural gas. So we've just gone out to the industry, the refiners, to say what, you know, how much natural gas do you use? Purchase natural gas from refiners. Refiners use natural gas to uh, create steam. They use it to create hydrogen, and they'll use it for cogeneration. They use electricity, the largest of which is Endeavor, um, formerly the solar, formerly the parts of so. So that's an example. We'll go out, not normally reported to us data, and the industry in all my years has always cooperated because we have a very good record of non-disclosure. So, uh, so this is going to be some background, uh, some deep dive, some higher level stuff to get you sort of grounded to understand the why there's oil, why the, why the oil is coming in, where is it coming from, why does it change over time. So next slide, please. Keep going. <coughs> All right, so there's been a big change in the United States, as, as many of you may know. Um, there's been a renaissance of crude oil production, and that's because of a couple of things. We have very large uh, shale reserves. That means rock, tight rock formations that you can fracture, and they contain light hydrocarbons. So once you fracture, the oil can then move. And so very large reserves. Okay, that's good. And Drilling technology, 3D seismic, um, supercomputer use, they're able to really direct where drilling goes and over very long distances, upwards of three and four miles horizontal distance. It's remarkable what's done. And so that technology in this resource has been deployed, and the results you see here are three main fields uh, in the United States, Eagle Ford and Permian Basin, <coughs> of Texas, purple and brown lines, Bakken is in the Dakotas. So you see, they have tailed off. And that's a consequence of a fall in oil prices, drill rigs not being deployed. Permian Basin defies that. Why? They have least cost production, closest uh, access to distribution infrastructure, and gathering systems, pipelines, transfer lines to get into ultimately the customers in the Gulf Coast of Louisiana. So they, it's, I, I can't even believe that, but I mean, there they go. And this is in the environment of $45 to $55 a barrel oil. So OPEC, as you know, they said, hey, we're going we're gonna to flood the market initially. <clears throat> they did that. Drove the price down from $120 to kill the shale industry in California. Yes, successful for the high cost producers, inefficient producers, People didn't really know what they were doing, jumped into it. The very sophisticated ones, the ones that learned the hard way, and gobbled up resources for pennies on the dollar, meaning equipment and acreage, they're the ones still producing. And they've learned. Part of the ease of production in, say, the Bach and the Permian Basin is the structure of the field is fairly uniform. So you can go in and, and once you understand your acreage, and you have similar acreage, now you have cookie cutter process. Take what you're doing with your drill rig and go do the same thing. Costs go way down. And now the drill rigs are drilling, go set up your drill rig, are drilling upwards of six, seven, and eight wells. So not moving. Set up, drill. Now, step one. Step two, deplete the well. Fracture it. Hydraulic fracturing has to occur. So there's a huge backlog now in these areas. They haven't drilled yet. So that means when the price goes up, they'll go back and drill. And so that's a very strange dynamic for shale production and what OPEC is, is facing. So now they curtail production to try to prop prices up. Russia has agreed to cooperate, but they have some 
from children like Libya, Nigeria, who have their own internal problems, and they're starting to get their act together and show production. So that counteracts what OPEC cuts are. So they're trying to prop up prices. So 2018, people think prices can be in the $65, $70 bar barrel range. So what happens is a growth fracking backlog, they go to work. Instantaneous increase in production. So that's what's going to happen to OPEC as the price goes up, more production from the U.S. So U.S. production is expected to break the all-time record in 1970 sometime next year. So uh, next slide, please. There you go. So here's the production, and you see uh, 1970 isn't even on this chart. It goes back to 81, uh, but that is 10 million barrels a day. And like I said, EIA is expecting sometime in 2018 for that record to be broken. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just a snapshot, August of, of this year, versus January 2010. Where's the biggest increase? Texas, of course, two main fields, and then North Dakota. But look at, there's some other places you wouldn't think of. New Mexico, Colorado, Oklahoma is an old time oil production area. They've had significant increase and in, in change, almost 300,000 barrels a day, whereas over here in California, it continues to go down. And in Alaska, even more so. So these declines are inevitable. It's geologic certainty, older fields, diminishing returns. So in California, you would think, well, biggest shale reserves in the United States, according to you know, um, USGS, true. But remember, I said in these other areas where they're drilling, uniform basins, well understood geology, not in California. Look how many fault lines there are, hundreds. How many folds and declines? It is extremely complex geology in California. So that means very expensive to do shale development. That's why very little to nothing is going on with shale and won't go on. Argentina is doing shale development of large resources. Chevron's working down there with the local uh, national oil company, and China is doing some more, um, some more work in the area. They have large resources too. Next slide, please. Something else has been going on. A change in trend is you see all these blue lines. That's Canada. So exports were going to Canada, and oh by the way, yeah, you couldn't export oil wasn't permissible from the United States. So there were restrictions. Ah, oh, you could have exceptions to Canada. Light barrels up, light barrels back. So some refinery is better situated to receive U.S. barrels and the volume goes down to this place that, that was okay. So a lot of that was going on, oil was increasing. In small amounts to other places through approval. So that all changed here. And now you've seen the market reacted. Okay, we'll move more barrels. Almost all of this comes, uh, essentially all of this comes out of the U.S. Gulf Coast. So a little bit out of Alaska, opportunistic movements, but um, it's moving on the Gulf Coast. And it's going, you know, Asia is more and more of this, large refining um, complex. So this is data from EIA that you can look at. But uh, So that's a changing trend as well. Next slide, please. So like I said, California, peak. 1985, down, down, down. A little uptick here, but when prices were 120, but basically going down, down. Next slide. And as that goes down, the green over a shorter time period from 1982, you still have to make it up. So as that volume goes down, and Alaska is naturally declining, we're getting less, Washington is getting less, foreign volume comes in. And that's basically from anywhere. And this includes a very tiny amount of domestic movement by rail and marine, which I'll talk about. Uh, but it's it's almost de minimis mm -hmm. at this point. Next slide, please. So this is just to show you diversity of crude oil, all the different countries. But you'll recognize some close neighbors like Ecuador in red, and you see something like uh, um, Colombia is is getting a bit bigger, and that's because you go to the closest market. Lowest transportation cost, do a short route. So the normal customer is the United States. So typically that's where stuff will come. You're competing against Asian refiners, Indian refiners who want oil, but this is a long way to go to get that. 
And so that's why you, of course, would expect to see a disproportionate portion of, of production from down there coming. And this is California. If you look at some of the data going into the United States, you see a lot of Venezuela oil going there, about 750,000 barrels a day. Um, that doesn't show up anywhere on here. Pasco through the Panama Canal, things have gone up recently. It's like $350,000 per passage. So it's quite expensive. Next slide. Breaks, breaks it out. This is from EIA. You can see there's Colombia, Green Pie, Wedge, Ecuador. Very large volumes. Of course, Saudi Arabia, second largest producer in the world of crude oil, second to Russia. And pretty soon we'll see that the U.S. will be right up there and may exceed Russian production. Uh, next slide, please. So, as was mentioned at the outset, uh, you know, concern of heavy oil. People look at Canada and go, bad oil, tar sands, heavy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's some heavy oil, and I'll talk about that. Um, but what happens to the heavy oil? It doesn't stay heavy. If you mine it, um, and you, or you cook it out of the ground in Canada, it's not going to stay in that state necessarily. It'll be upgraded. So once it's upgraded, it's mortar oil. It's not going to, it's not a sinker. Um, but it's from a high carbon intensity extraction methodology, uh, certainly. But so you see a trend here in the U.S. Canadian oil as a sort of percentage of foreign imports over 40 percent. But where else would it go? Canada has a tough time getting oil offshore. You need pipelines to the coast, and those are hard to come by, as I'll point out in just a minute. California, opposite trend, flat, maybe a little declining, 2% of foreign imports. And remember, foreign imports are half. So that's half that number at 1%. So it's a small amount coming in to, um, to uh, California historically. And in the future, that could go up. Yes. Um, next slide, please. Yeah. So how does it get in here? And this is where all of you have a, a stronger interest. Uh, certainly, waterborne is already in the water. So a breach is already in, in a marine environment. Um, this will be salt and freshwater environment movements. And about almost two thirds of the oil coming into Northern California by marine vessel. And they're from all over the world. And uh, they're not as large a capacity discharge as, say, Southern California. And that has to do with the ability for a marine group to handle a large, deep draft vessel. And so most vessels, I mean, Chevron, Richmond, Longworth is on the, uh, on the good side of the Pinole Shoals. You want to get past that. You're going to have to be lighter vessels, smaller vessels, so they increase the cost. So, but a smaller volume and smaller potential consequence because of the middle shoals. Um, next slide, please. Now, in Southern California, remarkably similar, 67% of their oil in 2016 from waterborne sources. Most of it foreign, some Alaska coming down there. Uh, next slide, please. Pipeline. That's basically the balance. So it's all coming from the Kern County area, southern San Joaquin Valley, and the main trunk lines, three lines going north, and basically three lines going into southern, Cal southern California. They're the ones where the oil is going to go through. And you have combinations, in this case, of you can have heavy oil combined with diluent. To make it flow. Okay, the viscosity is such that it actually flow. Uh, I think there's some heated pipeline elements that can have a heavier oil, but it has to be remain heated. And I'll talk about the rail uh, next. But the rail is basically most all of it now, especially in, in 2017, is coming into the um, Bakersfield region. One little cargo went into Southern California, but it's coming here. It's not going to Northern California. So rail movement is coming all the way down. And it's coming over from Wyoming and Canada, from the north, and from New Mexico. So it's coming straight across into, into the biggest whole region. So that's where it's going. Next slide, please. 
So rail did sort of take off, and the green bars are the volumes, monthly volumes, and you see they peaked in 2013 and 14, and that's basically when the discount was large enough producers. And why would they discount their oil if you're producing it? Because you don't have an outlet for it. If the pipeline is full, where are you going to go? And so you can shut your well in, or you can discount the price enough that a customer will go, okay, I'll pay a higher rail tariff, I'll move it that way. So that's why Kuba Rail came about. There was congestion in the pipeline takeaway capacity. Pipelines can never keep ahead of or keep pace of production surges. You can never do that. Because why? They take years to get just your permit, purchase land right away, and then build. Years. Think of Keystone. Still nothing. Keystone XL. And so <coughs> the industry took advantage of it, built these facilities quickly within six months. Uh, they pay for themselves in you know, up to 18, you know, six to 18 months. Um, and so small capital expenditure. So you saw lots of loading facilities in the oil producing areas, the new ones, and lots of receiving places. But it went up and went down following this count. Now it's, this is the lowest point since 2011. Next, next slide, please. So, but another trend is going on, and that's Canadian crossing the border via rail and then going to some U.S. refineries. That is now upwards of consistently over 30% of all the rail movement is Canadian source. This is expected to go higher. One of the main Canadian uh, transporting entities, rail transporters, said just yesterday they expect 2018 rail movements to go up. Why? Not enough pipeline takeaway capacity in Canada, more Canadian crude coming online. It wants to find a home, and it has to be by rail. Incremental volumes. Next slide. So Canada, total stack bar going up, up, up. That's the forecast. Uh, a lot of it is in heavy oil growth, 90%. But once again, we'll sort of talk about you know what happens. This is oil sand heavy, and um, how that is actually blended and what it actually looks like depends on, on the region. Next slide, please. So here are the pipelines coming through, um, sort of existing, and you see some dotted lines and people want to build some pipeline capacity. Next slide, please. These are other pipeline projects um, that are existing, and ones that are, that are going to be coming in um, aren't shown on this chart, but this is showing that the supply is already going to exceed pipeline takeaway capacity. That's why you're seeing more Canadian rail. Now you're going to see more. Next slide, please. Here are the projects um, to expand the ability to get Canadian crude oil out of that country to the coast or down to the Gulf Coast refineries. Well, one of them, <coughs> this one, a million barrels a day. That is done. They pulled the plug. Trans Canada will not pursue that project. They, they expended $1.2, $1.8 billion on that. So they're not going for, uh, forward with that project. So that takes away a potential export market or safety valve for any oil producers. The others are still in play. Trans Mountain on the far left going to Vancouver, which more barrels can get there. They can go anywhere. But the clients who are signing up for that, long-term contracts or commitments to do that um, in open season business process, they're Asian, Southeast Asian. So likely we'll go on the vessel and want to go that. But it doesn't mean it can't come down to California along the coast. So these other ones are still in play, even, even uh, Keystone XL, but we'll see what the economics are on that. Next slide, please. So Washington, sort of, they got there first, uh, recognized, hey, we're going to be screwed. Alaska is going down and it's a disproportionate amount of oil. So we had to look for replacements. Shale was coming into Vogue. They saw the discounts, and so they built facilities. So several refineries have active ability to import. And uh, next slide, please. And here are the rail routes. 
But you, you think, oh, well, so they could be going here, they could be going here, they could be going here, but actually, see the Washington tracks where it goes. So on the far left, you see a big orange line. That's actually the rail volume. So where is it going? Well, it's going down along the Columbia River. And it goes up to the Puget Sound. So that is where it's going. And that's you know, through um, uh, 2017, September of 2017. And there are 25% of receipts are by rail. So that's not expected to go away anytime soon, especially because they have those facilities constructed already. Next slide. So this is another way to look at how they get their total oil. ANS is the blue, you see Canadian oil, that's via pipeline, and then you see rail movements and other imports, you get some waterborne import. And then they, they break down the regions and their modes. So if you look just with your eye, it's hard to read back the room, I apologize. Rail is the smallest component, but Washington, the dark green, evergreen, dark evergreen, um, that is, uh, that's the largest um, part where you see rail in Oregon a little bit. And then you see um, marine vessel and pipeline are very important means. Pipeline, of course, is the safest, least expensive, that's why. But you have to have a point of demand and you have to have a point of production that you're connecting by pipeline. So it makes sense to move it by that least cost means. Long-term context. Next, next slide, please. California, late to the party, um, but a different kind of permit environment, one could say, I'm talking to the industry. Um, they, I've heard people tell me, yeah, with enough time and money, you can get anything permitted. That's what they used to tell me. Now maybe some things you ultimately can't. So a lot of uh, permits, uh, people uh, walked away from some of them. Westpac was uh, one facility, uh, uh, Pittsburgh, Antioch, Northern California, uh, Alara Venetia, years, denied. And they're not going to pursue that. Santa Maria, uh, permit denied down there as well. And that's sort of a landlocked refinery that's taking coastal offshore oil, partially processing it, and it continues on its so way up to Rodeo via pipeline. However, you may recall a Santa Barbara pipeline spill of Claims All American. Lying down. That was getting ExxonMobil production offshore, and that was going where? To Santa Maria. Not so much anymore. That line shut down, the subsequent uh, line shut down because of lots of um, uh, issues with the line when they did some additional smart pig uh, analysis through there. So uh, we'll see if that comes back, but they're doing more trucking of oil to that facility, but running at lower rates. Um, so these were other ones doing manifest mixed cars, rail movements. Uh, some of them, except for uh, Kinder Morgan, would receive not quite a unit train in there, but into Richmond. And then they transload, move it from the rail car into a tanker truck, and then go on their way. And the customer publicly announced was uh, Tesoro Golden Eagle. That's who was taking those, those trucks. Um, so, we're never going to get to a level of Washington. And the only, so this Plains Bakersfield one, this is in Taft. This can handle a unit train a day. It's the only one. And you would look on the satellite imagery and go, where's the refinery? And that's right, none in Taft. Not a lot of anything in Taft. It's out in the boonies, actually. And so why there? Away from Population Center? Yeah, but no. They want to get where my pipeline slide shows the lines. This facility can get access to basically all of that. So if their customer is in Northern California and wants to move oil on one of those pipelines, planes can get into that system. Going south, the same thing. So it's ideally situated logistically. However, operate at full capacity? No. Next slide, please. If it was, uh, we'd be averaging over 100,000 barrels a day. Of course, we're not. <laughs> we're less than, we're 0.4% of our oil is by rail movement. So that's not happening. Uh, there was a, a, an uptake here, and as far as 
Canadian came back down and, and is surging a bit more. We expect more of the main, remainder this year and into 2018 or going in. That's why basically all of this oil here is basically all going to the Bakersfield region. Next slide, please. Keep going. So just, um, well, this is, uh, I'll, I'll move through these more quickly. We use a lot of oil because that's how we produce our transportation fuels. I mean, we use a lot of those. 60 million gallons a day, gas and diesel and jet. Uh, so, but what's interesting is 40 refineries, 82. That's basically when we started collecting data at the commission. That's just check the peak notes very well. And then 15 operating today. Yet, 62% fewer facilities. We produce more transportation fuels than we did in 82. The band's up, of course. But they're very sophisticated facilities. So people say, oh, they can handle anything. Heavy oil, light oil. True, they can, but that's not how they, they don't run a whole bunch of heavy, run a whole bunch of light. That's not how the refinery is set up to operate. Next slide, please. And this is just a breakdown of, you've seen these uh, more specificity. Lots of foreign, Alaska, pipeline, and then a very 6,000 barrels per day out of, you know, 1.6 million. So it's a very small rail at this time, and we don't expect that to be a um, significant increase. Next, next slide, please. So they produce more than just fuel. There's other uh, materials, residual fuel oil, asphalt, um, petroleum coke, things like that. So, and they produce export fuel, missile gasoline, and EPA diesel. Those go to Nevada and Arizona. Via pipeline. Next slide. So they have marine terminals in Northern California, so they can get access to pretty much anything. And they own the docks in Northern California. They control them, and they've been upgraded to meet I think all of I think all of them, maybe um, um, Andy Deber is the last one, to meet uh, marine oil terminal engineering and maintenance standards or MOTEMS, State Land Commission. So that's basically seismic. Tidal tsunami type um, building code standards. So they beat them up, right? Fully so. Next slide, please. Southern California, you see them further inland because that's where the oil fields were, but they all have access to the water. Those assets are owned by the cities of Los Angeles and Long Beach. And a long time ago, purposely so, control rents. So they're the landlord. And so the oil companies and others are somewhat at the mercy of the owners when it comes to renewing their lease. So this is coming up periodically, a pressure from the cities to make, they want the stuff to go away, some elements do. And it's like, well, it's part of the plumbing, where are you going to go? So, next slide. So this is from our monthly data collection, and we look at what the refineries run or receive to their facility and the this type of quality data is basically what we get it's api gravity or you can figure out the density from that the higher the api number the lighter the oil the lower the number um, the heavier the oil so we see the api gravity of what they process collectively for the month and the sulfur content so we've taken this data this is the san francisco bay area refineries and we, we did an average for the year. So, yes, does it move around from one year to the next? It sure does. And it appears to move around a lot by the scale here. If this is 1.2 uh, weight percent sulfur up to 1.6. Narrow range. Look at API. 25.2 up to you know 26.8. This is a very sort of narrow range. It looks big here. So next slide, please. So people are saying, some people are saying, hey, a whole bunch more Canadians going to come down here. They're going to change the diet in the refinery. They're going to move to a very heavy oil, which is a concern for movement, transport, or, or just for beer. Um, it's a concern for uh, potential emissions, energy, um, energy utilization at the refineries uh, for the locals in the Bay Area and Southern California. So I push back and I say, uh, that's not likely to happen. So next slide. So this is the same data, different scale. So 
Here is the envelope the refineries collectively operate in over 10 years. Have they moved way over here? Uh, no. Uh, way up to a lighter oil, down to a heavier, high, high sulfur? No, they haven't. All these dots are Canadian imports. The API and sulfur content of different types of oil from Canada. So they will not move there. They don't have the equipment. They'll never get the permit. So how they run their oils, they blend them. You saw the diversity slide from all those different foreign countries. They don't run a batch from Iraq and then, oh, let's run something from Colombia. No, they store them, they blend them, and they want to get to a, a envelope of properties. API gravity, sulfur, of course, the total acid number, metal content. They're looking at an envelope for their equipment, their energy costs, their hydrogen balance, steam balance. So year, month in, month out, year in, year out, they will be in this envelope. So if they get heavier oils than in the past, they would offset that with what? Lighter oils, more of. And so we have the same amount. But it does mean there are eight potential consequences. Heavier oil movement over the water could occur um, and, and come in there, um, but they won't shift predominantly to that kind of diet. Next slide, please. So I mentioned we collect data. I mentioned a strong uh, non disclosure or confidentiality provisions. Uh, this is a laundry list. You can go to our website of two forms. M700 is a monthly form, M, and it's import export internal movement in California. Um, so all refiners, transporters fill that out every month. Um, and then we have uh, a monthly refinery report. So those two forms have crude oil property data, but limited. Um, I'll show you. Next slide, please. So EIA also collects um, an, this, this form, and we, we basically get uh, this piggyback copy from EIA or from the company. So one company fills out one form, they just give us a copy. So we use the data. So here you see weighted average sulfur content, weighted average API gravity for receipts or inputs. And basically everyone says receipts. Basically what comes in is what you're going to use um, in the month. So, so we don't see individual shipment. And this will tell you country or place of origin. It does not do that. So if you want to figure out the type, lots of different Canadian crude oils, they have different name designations, and they have different meanings. Once you know what the flavor is, you go, ah, that's produced by this method or that method. Next slide, please. So EIA has something that does give you more information about that type. So you can go, aha, well, it's not just Canadian, but it's it's from Western Canadian Select. It's from the pipeline. So it's going to have what? This API range and the sulfur content. So they use a code, and you can go look their code up, and they put this in. And they're trying to collect volume and price information to do a refinery acquisition cost calculation for the United States or a region. So they want to know where it was loaded, when it was loaded, what marine vessels saw. And this is the kind of data that we collect also for our own purposes. We don't get this form. This is not something we have as part of our uh, data collection. However, we're going, going to be going through a rulemaking, and so this is for the group to think about. Is this kind of information something would be of interest to, say, Osprey and others that we could collect, you know, we could aggregate report on, or you could MOU with Osper to, because the data is collected and reported. It's not a burden on the industry to give us a carbon copy of this. So this is somewhere we could go. So that's by every single cargo to every single destination. But once again, after the fact. Sorry, right. Next slide, please. So I mentioned our M700, and I apologize. Yeah, there is no API gravity and sulfur content on what we collect. There's uh, very good information on its loading point, the marine vessel was on, where it was discharged, the volume, where it's coming from, and uh, but we don't use names or types of crude oil for um, on our form. Um, and peers, anyone can buy that. Very expensive. 
Uh, this is basically foreign movements only in and out. And people go down to the um, and pull the records and compile a database. That's what Peers does. So it's very intensive, takes a lot of time, and then they sell the data. So we get this because we're trying to figure out what we think is a accurate accounting of in and out the products. So this data helps along with our own. Next slide, please. State Lands Commission, uh, more recently, and a wonderful product. This is actually something that anyone can request and receive, but not posted on their website. <coughs> um, they don't have API grabbing software content either. But they'll say, which marine terminal exactly, volume, date. Uh, and so we use this information and vessel name we use this information to make sure it, it, it aligns with the other data sources. So this helps us <coughs> try to be as accurate as, as possible. So also more recently, class one railroad movements. Since you know, I think 2012, uh, we we got the very you know you know the railroad companies they're very cooperative and helpful. Um, <laughs> not, or, um, uh, eventually, um, can't partially. So so they've actually. Um, have been providing us with monthly data sets on deliveries by their codes, but it's, it's crude oil, it's biodiesel, renewable diesel, ethanol. We're very interested in those movements. It's gasoline, very rare. Gasoline components like butane, a propane movement. So we get this data and it tells you where it drops the cars off. That's how I know where the crude oil is being delivered to because I see what the drop off code or designation is for BNSF or Union Pacific. Uh, but API grabbing sulfur content not included. Uh, we get the volume by individual rail car. But what we don't get is the weight. We have the weight, we can figure out the density by individual rail car. So we don't have that, but the rail class ones do. Of course, they know the weight. The most important element in their data tracking system is the weight of individual cars, because that's the limits over the specific routes they're traversing, and that's how people are charged. So, so they have it. We don't get it. Now we're going to circle back to the very cooperative rail companies and say, "Hey, could you, uh, could you include another field in your data dump for us?" And, you know, so we'll try. So we're, we're going to go down that way. So next slide, please. The Air Resources Board, oh, by the way, low carbon fuel standard. Low carbon fuel standard is to reduce carbon intensity of gasoline and diesel. Also, crude oil aspect to the regulation. What is that? Well, they track what the carbon intensity is the crude oil being used in California, year in, year out. And how the regulation work is if the carbon intensity goes up from the baseline, they'll circle back to all the refiners and say, hey, everybody, carbon intensity went up collectively to the crude oil. All of you have to, on a prorated basis, get more carbon credits to offset that increase. So that's their mechanism to guard against a rise in carbon intensity. So higher carbon intensity doesn't mean necessarily heavy oil, it's just a high energy extraction processing. Um, so you can have very high carbon intensity or CI oils can be very light. They're upgraded crude oils. They, took, they dug up the sand, took it by big, huge dump trucks, conveyors, and cooked it. And out comes motor oil. So that's not a risk to the environment in terms of potential sinking oil. Uh, but it's a very high carbon intensity. So I went through these names that are reported by the Air Resource Board. And anyone can go get this, look at it year in, year out for the state. Can't see where it went, but ARB knows where it went. So that's protected information, confidential. So I graded it as oil sand source, mined. Carbon intensity, and I've also, uh, I didn't put them here, um, it was a little too much, but um, I think for Jeff and some others, I've, I've done like, what's the API grab in there? So you can see. But once again, in here, you won't see something that's 
tent. I mean, it's not going to be, you know, density that will sink your water directly. That would have to be a heated oil. So he, heavy oil is extracted, is transported by rail car in some cases, mostly by pipeline, but it's all heated. Rail cars are loaded, it coils inside them, and then when they get to the destination, they inject them with steam, reheat the oil, extract the oil from the rail cars. That's how they do that. There's a oil can rail car movement in, in, in California, it goes from Monterey area down to Southern California. Oil can movement, and that's heavy oil, and it's heated to get it out. Um, so that, that, so that um, um, kind of heavy oil movement could occur, but it's rare. So the heavy oils that all of you would be concerned about is, what about something that's mixed with a diluent to get it to flow? Well, there's a lot of that that goes on. There's a lot of that in the Canadian pipelines, purposely so. Condensate blended with the oil moves down the pipeline. Condensate is extracted, piped back in a parallel pipeline to use it again. There's some loss that goes on, but it's, it's relatively small. That's just to move it. But there's also oil that comes down, blended with condensate, or dill bit, slowed into rail cars to keep it of appropriate density to move it, to pump it in and out. So the condensate is still there. It's cooked off at the refineries or pre-processed ahead of time. But that's a type of oil blend with, with dilu of a diluent that, who knows, a subsequent speaker, possibly. Um, what happens when that mixture gets into an ocean, a water, a, um, a riparian habitat? Does the light material eventually evaporate enough that there's a heavier component that can now be heavier than water to sink. Not for me to answer, not my area of expertise, but clearly that kind of material is in transit in marine vessels and in rail cars coming to California. Next slide, please. So we don't get a heads up. Hey, um, ship it coming, just letting you know, rail, marine. We don't get that. Uh, we are aware the Coast Guard has a advanced heads up for all cargo movements coming in. And you go into a system and enter that, their e-system and, and uh, email and, and enter that information. However, Turner's saying that it's just crude oil. So that's, that's, that's what I'm transporting. No differentiation as to the type, density, et cetera. So this may be an area to examine as could could uh, shippers be required to report to the state of California in this system with a simple, you know, add-on, check this box kind of thing onto the type of crude oil you're moving? Because the ship, the owner of the car, they'll know, but they'll know the type of crude oil per those codes that uh, EIA uses, per the designations that ARB uses, they'll know that. So is that something that they could be compelled through legislation, cooperation, don't know. Uh, but that may be something to, to take a look at. And we're going to see, um, talk to the rail companies, um, because I'm not sure exactly, maybe someone in the room knows about what's happening in Washington. You saw the chart I showed. You, showed, you saw the route. Um, they know the route it takes, and they know the volumes, and they report this quarterly. So the question is, are they also getting the heads up for shipping it? So someone's nodding their head, yes, they're getting that information. So if a rail, if the class ones are reporting the heads up, it's coming kind of thing to a state, then why can't they report that to another state? So if a precedent has been set, clearly that was a legislation that worked out. Um, that's the case, so thank you for that. Um, next slide, I think that's uh, Okay, all right. Okay. Give me crap last time. I didn't have a bird at the end of my presentation. Specific gravity of in state production. Specific gravity of in state production. I I have a slide on there, but it's in the it's, it's going to be similar to the total API gravities that are showing between 25 and 26. Clearly, there are fields producing that um, have much heavier 
oil that's being produced. More than half the oil in California is extracted through steam injection, thermally enhanced oil recovery. That's almost 60%. Dogger used to report the data. Good luck with that now. You have to you do some extraction from their very difficult to maneuver through data set. And oh, by the way, 50,000 producing wells. So that's these main barrels a day on average. So, um, so yeah, there's different, lots of different gravities and sulfur contents in California, but ultimately they go into pipelines and the companies, Plains All American, KLM now, uh, I think we bought KLM, uh, uh, Shell, they, they will operate the pipeline to make sure it moves and is in a range of gravity for their customers. So it's how they blend the oils to, to move through lines. And the same thing they do in Canada and the United States. So um, so that's that's something they'll they'll move through. So but but Brian, we can come back with some um, some more specificity on the California API gravities to see if it's demonstratively different than that twenty-five to twenty-six on some of those pipeline routes. So we can come back to that word. Right. So I guess questions at the end. Questions are being held to the end of the to the panel discussion. Okay. It's a <laughs> 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 Um, 
so the, the key threshold for whether an oil is going to float or sink in fresh water is whether or not the API gravity is above 10. If it's above 10, then it's going to float in fresh water. <coughs> Another question which could be potentially important for not floating oil response is the viscosity of the oil. Um, if you think about it, a low viscosity oil is going to be able to break up into droplets much more easily with much less wave energy or turbulence than a, than a really viscous oil. We'll talk about that. Uh, the viscosity tends to change with temperature and through weathering processes. So uh, initially, a oil that has low viscosity can, as it weathers, become more and more viscous as time goes on. And so it's behavior in the environment. Also, I threw in persistence because uh, one of the one of the elements in SD709 was talking about the potential, uh, essentially a potentially non-floating oil, one that could float initially and then sink later on. So that's it has to be a persistent oil to really do that. There are um, <clears throat> lower viscosity oils that tend to be persistent, but there but there are some oils I think that are maybe persistent but may not may not be low viscosity. There's a DBL 152 we'll talk about that was a pretty low viscosity oil, but it was a very heavy oil. Um, so this it's something to think about. It's oftentimes going to be related to the viscosity, but I think it's something something to be considering because the degree of persistence in oil. Uh, density. Uh, you have uh, fresh water, which has a which has a, um, a salinity of zero, and salt water, which has a salinity of around 35. Salt water is more dense than fresh water, which is why I think salt water is more dense than salt water than fresh water. So, in and the API gravity equivalent, essentially for salt water, is between six and seven. So, in theory, you could have an oil that any any oil that's going to float in fresh water is going to float in salt water. But in theory, you could have an oil that floats in fresh in salt water that then does not float in fresh water. I don't know if you're necessarily going to have a spill scenario that's going to, where that's going to play out, but it's something that you can actually think about. So it's not just about the density of the oil itself, but also the receiving water that it gets spilled to. Next slide. Uh, this is just to help you conceptualize the concept of viscosity. Here's some household. Uh, items and their viscosity, relative viscosity. So if you think about if you had a jar of water and olive oil and you shake it, um, it doesn't take a lot of energy to break up that olive oil into small droplets and physically disperse it out, that water and olive. But if you had a jar with water and peanut butter for some reason and tried to shake it, it's not going to behave the same way, right? And uh, so its ability to get physically dispersed the water column is going to be much more difficult. And it's Propensity to pick up sediment if you have sediment in that jar as well might be much different for peanut butter than oil than, a, than an olive oil type of situation. So if you think about that conceptually and apply that to oil viscosities, uh, it may be helpful to kind of think through it. Next slide. Um, so this is a graphic from the one of the API guidance documents. Uh, I'm going to try to focus on some case studies in the following slides. Initially, talk about uh, oil that float um, and have some level of sediment interactions. So next slide. All right, next slide. Um, so there's, as I said, there's 38 uh, case studies in the API document. I have a printout here if you want to look at it during the break. I flagged the ones that I've mentioned here in this talk. Um, but I'm sure you read through all the documents already. Here, here are <laughs> three, uh, three still cases that had oil that was initially floating oil that then sank. Um, next slide. Uh, first one is the Morris J. Berman in 1994 down in Puerto Rico. If this is spilled in fresh water, you notice the API gravity is below 10. So it could have potentially sunk in if it had spilled in fresh water, but it was spilled in salt water. So it did float initially, came in contact with sandy shorelines, picked up sand, and then sunk in near shore waters. <coughs> um, and so what happens, though, in some of these clear water, shallow bays, as those bay waters heated up, the viscosity changed. Viscosity went lower, and the sand grains essentially that were picked up in that oil dropped through the sand or dropped through the oil, and basically the oil started dripping up, kind of like a lava oil. So the, the temperature and how that affects the change in viscosity might be, might be an issue to think about. Next slide. Ethos 1 on the Delaware River. This is, a, this is a Venezuelan crude oil. This is initially floating oil, even in fresh water. It was built into a river environment, Delaware River. Uh, but as I understand it, the the, when the oil left the ship, it basically got injected into the sediment, so it picked up a lot of sediment initially. So you had oil 
that was in the midwater column and kind of rolling along the bottom, depending on what the turbidity regime was. Some people in the room may have actually worked out the electric mechanism. I was going to show up and figure it out. Yeah, that's what I was So, this is initially floating oil, picked up sediment, and, and came in off floating oil. Press. Next slide. Enbridge pipeline, this is a dill bit blend. Uh, this involves uh, Western Canadian Select and Cold Lake crude oils, which are two different uh, dill bits. And then there was also mixed in with that with the dilly one, which is a lighter end <coughs> refined product that helps to uh, achieve, when blended together, it helps to bring those heavier oils into a, an API range that's that's suitable for transport, right? So what ended up happening, so the so the blended API gravity for the oil in that pipeline that was filled was around 20. Um, <clears throat> it was filled into a riverine environment, relatively shallow. I don't know how shallow the creek was, it was really shallow. Um, and then initially that those lighter end, the diluent evaporated off pretty quickly and became an air emissions hazard for responders in local communities. Next slide. Uh, this is a graphic from a, an Environment Canada report that came out uh, a year or so ago about um, a similar to oil. This is, uh, Access Western Blend. Access Western Blend. <laughs> and, 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 and the Cold Lake Cruise Blend. Um, and you can kind of see how they have, their evaporation curves have those types of Still bits uh, evaporating a lot, a lot of those light ends off really quickly within the first couple of days. Whereas a refined heavier fuel oil um, is going to have a much less evaporative loss in the first few days. So what ended up happening was next slide, we're sick of this. Was this blended this dill bit? Uh, it had a lot of evaporative loss from the diluent initially in the first couple of days. It picked up sediment and then sank to the bottom. So then what that meant was there had to be a lot of agitation, kind of an agitation to try to release that along with the sediment. So this is what they were attempting to find for operation. So part of it was because of the behavior of how that dill bit evolves after it's spilled. Initially it floated, but then it lost a lot of, a lot, probably lost a lot of uh, the light ends through evaporation and also picked up sediment from energy. It was during a flood event, so and we're storing a flood event. Right, so it's a high turbidity yeah. issue. Also, it's high turbidity, high, 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 high energy. energy. I'm going to talk about uh, oils that don't initially float, that are, that are heavy oils initially, um, and then they interact with the sediment on the bottom. Next slide. Uh, it can take all sorts of shapes and sizes. Next slide. Cases I'm going to talk about. Uh, <laughs> some of you may have been around for the Pansanita in Southern California. Um, next slide, please. So the Pansanita was, uh, it was a ship being loaded in Long Beach. Uh, there was an explosion and fire. Um, the API gravity was such that it probably would have sunk if it was still in fresh water. Uh, it was, uh, some of the oil did actually float. Uh, a lot of it ended up going straight to the bottom. This is a low current. Environment, marine system, uh, but there's also burn residue too, so that probably made some of the oil even heavier than it was. And you had, there was pockets of oil, as I understand it, that were up to three meters deep. Uh, yeah, so it didn't actually travel very far, at least the, the sinking oil didn't travel very far, <coughs> and there was a big cleanup operation. Uh, but again, keep in mind this is a low current situation. Next slide. Still on the Ohio River, um, asphalt still, I don't know what's the API. Um, the, uh, some of the oil actually did float, but that was because it trapped your bubble and kept it in the water. But a lot of this oil was face to the bottom, and if you look at the survey data, it actually it stayed within 50 feet of the, of the, of the barge as it was getting to the fish at the bottom. So um, it was a rivering environment, but it was a high current situation. Uh, but it, but because of the nature of the oil, it didn't really the oil that sunk to the bottom didn't really travel very far. Well, that that oil was heated, and it was actually less dense than water, and floated while it was hot. And then as it floated downstream, it cooled down and started to sink. That's why I had some air bubbles in it. But I, I know some of the air the oil that air bubbles are trapped in travel quite a ways right now. So interaction 
extraction of sediments. This is going to get into kind of what I talked about before about viscosity um, as well. So we'll talk about these next two case studies next slide. So the DPL 152 spill, which was my first spill as a double employee. <laughs> back in, uh, after Cuomo, a few months after Katrina. So this is about 30 miles offshore of Port Arthur, Texas, about 50 feet of wild water. It was the largest sinking oil spill in the U.S. at the time, about 3 million gallons. Um, uh, there was, we did overplights of it, and there was not much surface expression of the oil. There was some change in such on the surface, but not much. API, the average API gravity was 3.7, which would sink in fresh water. It also sink in water. Um, and uh, because the water was deep enough, there really wasn't a lot of turbulence along the bottom, except when the storm was rolled through. So next slide. Having a composite sample off the off the vessel and taking and spreading into a fish tank and example of the site water. Next slide. It went straight to the bottom, and it was also a, so it was a really heavy oil, but it was also a really low viscosity oil. See how it kind of looks like uh, like olive oil droplets. If you looked at the <coughs> excuse me, watch the diver videos of them waving their hands over this puddle of oil on the bottom, you can kind of see it breaking up into droplets and then settling back down to the bottom. Um, <laughs> Uh, but cool, from a, from a technical standpoint. So next slide. And so our conceptual model of how to kind of think through this problem was, you've got you've got this oil sitting, this low viscosity sinking oil sitting on the bottom. You don't have a lot of turbulence along the bottom until a wave, until a storm comes through that really has a lot of sort of wave and these turbulence down there. And that kind of breaks up the oil, the puddles of oil at the bottom into large and small droplets. The large droplets don't travel very far. Um, so smaller droplets get higher up into the water column and they may be able to travel further. So then you have this different puddles of oil along the bottom. So that provided a lot of challenges both so figuring out where the oil was, but also how to growl and how to how to you know. So this is so the DBL 152 was a slurry oil. This is a clarified slurry oil. I'm not sure what the distinctions are, maybe some people don't know it. But this is a spill in the fresh water. Very heavy oil, minus 7.4 API. I have a hard time even conceiving what that means, having a negative API. But, um, but there's also a much higher viscosity oil. It's much more like, uh, so the EBL 152 is more like maybe olive oil. This is more like molasses. And it's in a rivery environment, so it's fresh water, but it's also a lower current. So next slide. Oh. This, is the, this is the impact zone in the, in the barge. Next slide. And a sample from the barge poured into site water. It's kind of like molasses that went straight to the bottom. But because it's such a low current environment, it didn't really, the oil itself that went to the bottom didn't travel very far. So it was uh, primarily located in the collision zone and then where the barge was grounded afterwards. I think we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, next slide. So just to kind of <clears throat> think about some property behavior considerations, um, you know. Understanding that density of the oil is important, but also the receiving waters. Uh, Orton mentioned a lot of information is contained, especially for Canadian crudes, in just the name of the crude. Uh, you know, when, when we're trying to think through these issues about what's the density of the oil, what's the viscosity of the oil, a lot of people say, oh, just look at the SDS, the safety, the, uh, safety data sheet, right? But that's usually such a generic document and gives such a wide range, it's really not very useful. Uh, sometimes shippers, and correct me if I'm wrong, will have there will have been chemical assays done of oil either by the by the shipper or by the by the facility that's selling the oil or the facility that's receiving it because they have certain property requirements. <coughs> so those chemical assays may be available not by the vessel operator, but by either the buyer of that oil or the or the user of that oil. So that might be something to chase down during the farm. Um, uh, but also need to think about what the what the potential consideration is for potential for sedimentation or uh, evaporation. Um, for heavier oils, viscosity and currents can be a particularly a particular issue that's going to affect response consideration. Um, for Canadian crews, even if you don't, even just having the the oil field name or the oil Canadian oil name type, that's going to be a lot more informative about understanding the viscosity. API gravity, sulfur content, than the FDS. So, you know, either a, either a chemical.
clinical assay or And it helps you kind of think through what the weathering characteristics are of the oils that are within that blend. <clears throat> I don't, uh, I've only seen a couple of examples, a couple of studies that have talked about how different dill bits will behave in the environment with the evaporative loss. I don't know if we have a good handle on, collectively, if we have a good handle on the weathering characteristics of all those bitumens or all those different dill bit blends. But that's something that's worth kind of doing. But what the range is of possibilities for these different types of um, blends. So no questions. <laughs> <laughs> so it's break time. So let's 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 take a ten minute break. Be back at ten twenty, please.